most of you who are here today, Rob Tullis needs no introduction. Um, but for the, those of you who have been a part of Elkhart Farm Credit for the last eight years, you may not know Rob. Rob uh, was once a very instrumental part of the firm here. I was once important. He was once important. Uh, but I will take, I will give Elkis Manfredi credit for kindling in Rob uh, this passion for placement. <laughs> Rob was integral with our work that we did for Rick Caruso and, uh, and both the Grove and then later Americana at Brand. And uh, I think it became, it was latent, but it became a real passion for Rob and he now has uh, he works at GID Investment. He's crossed the line from being one of the family to now being a client of the family. And uh, I am your client. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And uh, he also heads, uh, co-chairs the BSA Placemaking Network. And these, this is a series of lectures that he's done over there uh, that are quite entertaining and quite informative. And so we've invited him in for August vacation to uh, talk to us about it. So Rob, tell us. All right, thanks guys. Wow, what a crowd. Um, so I am delighted to be back at Elvis Camp Freddy, um, and I thank you all for the opportunity to speak on the subject that, as John said, I feel is one of extreme importance for architects and urban designers. Um, yeah, this is the first of four talks uh, taken from that placemaking course. Um, I moved them around and honed them and whittled them down. Um, I'm actually not going to get through this whole talk today. Uh, I got about 50 minutes and then it goes to the second section of 15. That if people are willing to stay, I'm more than willing to go through the last section, but I don't want to impose on your, on your work day. Um, so today I'll be talking about placemaking thought, the published writings that I think are the foundation uh, of the subject, the writings that you should know. Um, I'll present three more talks on Friday mornings this month to talk about placemaking form on the 11th, placemaking activity on the 18th, and on August 25th, I'll conclude with a talk about sense of place. Um, is it real or just marketing jargon, and what do we mean by that term? There's a bibliography up front here on the table for those who are interested. And just as a, as a survey, how many people in this room know of the writings of a guy named Camillo Sint? Okay, right. How about Jane Jacobs? Okay. How about um, Holly White? William Holly White. Okay, good. All right. So, um, those are some of the people that I'll be talking about uh, today. So, why do we, uh, let, let's get into it. Why do we instinctively prefer some places and not others? Uh, we all have our touchstone references for distinctive, memorable, and beloved urban spaces. For streets, a good example is Barcelona's Las Ramblas, and for squares, it's the Italian piazza, Rome's Piazza Navona, shown here, for example. When I visit and study such examples, I ask why. Why are they successful and attractive? Is there something inherent in their form, in their DNA, that makes them resonate with, you, with the human pedestrian? And why do they somehow transform from space into place? And why do some spaces never make this transition? Why do some of today's most celebrated architects still produce horrible public places? Uh, this is the Maxi Museum of Art in the 21st century by Zaha Hadid in Rome, of all places. You gotta love the poor lonely guy that they placed in the middle of this vast wasteland and the people attempt to humanize it for the photo, and how the looming window on the upper right reflects the place across the street where you'd really rather be. <laughs> why, why, why? Well, I think the answer is the process of placemaking. People use this term in different ways, but for the purposes of these talks, here's my definition. It's, um, I gotta find my place here. It's the creation of a legible space within the city fabric with a distinct identity, one that has the power through its form and use to transform into a memorable entity that's attractive to people. In this transformation, space turns into place. It's not merely the voids between the structures left over when the building design is done. Now, obviously, places exist at many scales. This room is a place. North America is a place. They could be big or small. But for our definition, I'll focus on exterior public spaces that can be experienced as a single entity, taken in by the five senses as a single experience. Piazzas or squares are the best example, and they've been used for centuries 
as elements around which districts or cities are, are, are organized. Great places sometimes happen by accident, but not often. Some of the world's most famous public spaces were designed by a single hand at a single time. Many others evolved over time with a natural selection process that demolished failed components and saved successful ones, producing what seems today to be an effortlessly attractive place. But today's land use pressures often mean that architects are tasked with creating successful spaces instantly and out of whole cloth. Oh, this man Freddie does lots of this kind of work. Therefore, I believe that designers must care and think about the spaces we are creating for them to be successful. We must design space, not leave it to chance. We must be place-oriented, not project-oriented. And we should be knowledgeable about work, what works and what doesn't, and that's the purpose of these four talks. We must focus on both the form of the space and the use of that space, and how one informs the other. I maintain there's a third synergistic element that, when present, truly transforms space into place. It's been called emotion, memory, image, meaning, or even intrinsic relationship to contents. This je ne sais quoi component that attempts to describe how humans relate to space. Today, it's often called sense of place. Form, activity, and sense of place are the subjects of those next three talks. But today I'm going to talk about the authors who have thought about place and about what we can learn from them. In the time that I have, I can only touch on a few, but my bibliography, which is on that gray table over there, is full of good resources, including pattern books like these, where I often go to find the yardsticks against which to benchmark my work. So the godfather of placemaking thought is Camillo Sitt a Vienna architect who in 1889 published Der Stadtbau, or City Planning According to Artistic Principles. I don't speak German, I've never figured out how Der Stadtbau can translate into <laughs> City Planning According to Artistic Principles, but somehow I guess it does. Um, city Planning was then emerging as a separate discipline and Sitt saw that it was ruled by a technical focus driven by traffic and sanitation without artistic involvement. Architecture was a process of culturalization for Sitt and he set out instead to determine what attributes made certain urban spaces popular and beloved. He presented his findings using the graphic technique of figure ground analysis. You see some of the squares that he studied on the screen. Note how the streets have linear proportions and enter the piazza that define portals, and that all streets flow directly towards the piazzas, and how the piazzas appear to be outdoor rooms carved from the surrounding building mass, and that they all have defined shapes what we architects refer to as figural space, volumes of space rather than volumes in space. Sit distilled six principles for planning good city squares. One, integration of buildings and plazas, solid and void, buildings that form edges, turn corners, establish a view terminus. Two, open centers, influence the siting of uh, major public buildings and monuments off center. He makes a statistical argument that out of 255 churches in Rome, only six are freestanding, and two of those are modern ones. In relationship to citing monuments, fountains, and pavilions, he posits the snowman rule. He says, imagine a square covered in snow and crisscrossed by paths. Children don't build their snowmen on the paths. They build them off center, where they won't block the views and the desire lines. Three, enclosure, the degree to which the space's edge is defined, with controlled access points that frame views in and conceal views out. I'll talk about more of that in a second. Four, proportion of open space, not only pleasing proportions, but also how they influence major building placement. It sit assumes there's always going to be one major building on a piazza, and at that time, of course, most piazzas were dominated by churches or uh, government buildings. His focus is on experiential perception. He says that what counts is the position of the spectator and the direct direction in which he is looking. He says the size of the plaza should be in proportion to the height of its principal building, or vice versa, no less than its height and no more than twice its height. Like Renaissance guidelines, you'll note that this limits the vertical view angle to less than 45 degrees. Um, oops, sorry, I'll go back a bit. Um, irregularity of shape, the avoidance of overly simple and boring plan shapes relating to a sense of charm and mystery. Uh, Sit bashes, bashes the then current emphasis on straight thoroughfares. He favors the medieval irregular plazas that he surveys. And he even takes time to explain that the ancient Greek word symmetria did not originally mean left-right mirror image likeness, but quoting Vitruvius, quote, 
a proper agreement between the members of the work and the relation between the different parts, unquote. And six, harmonious groupings of clauses, composed relationships of linked spaces relating to a sense of narrative and to the phenomenon of changing vistas while walking. The sit waxes enthusiastically about Piazza San Marco in Venice, whose interrelated spaces meet each other at right angles and at corners, calling it, quote, the loveliest spot in the whole wide world, unquote. He hypothesizes about the effect of lining up all of its spaces, placing the campanile on a central axis, running a boulevard past one edge, concluding, one cannot bear the thought, everything would be destroyed, everything. Perhaps Sitt's most important principle in his argument that public squares should be enclosed entities is this notion of enclosure. He says that, quote, the main requirement for a plaza as for a room is the enclosed character of its space. And he calls it this most important and really essential prerequisite of any artistic effect, unquote. He makes his most famous forensic observation known as the turbine plaza when he writes, on further reflection, one realizes that by leading the streets off in the fashion of turbine blades, the most favorable conditions result, namely that from any point within the plaza, no more than a single view out of it is possible at a time. Here I show you a turbine analysis of Florence's Piazza della Signoria and GID's park in the center of our Regent Square project, which Elvis Van Freddy is working on. Note how the turbine action not only limits views out, but frames views in. Influenced by Sid, others published classifications of public squares, including uh, Herman Steuben in 1907, Paul Zucker in 1959, and Rob Freer, the older brother of architect Leon Freer in 1979. Hagelman and Peets, 1922 City Beautiful Thesaurus Civic Art, reproduced many of Camillo Sid's figure ground studies of squares. This go-to pattern books out of print copies became so coveted that the Princeton Architectural Press republished it in 1988, and I immediately Sitt's teachings became widely accepted, especially after a 1902 French translation. In less than a decade, his style of urban design came to be accepted as the norm. It ultimately influenced the Garden City movement and the City Beautiful movement. The modern movement rejected the carefully studied informality that he endorsed, and in the 1940s, it came to be regarded as old fashioned. Le Corbusier is known to have dismissed Sitt's methods as, quote, the pack donkey's way, unquote even though as a young man, he toured Europe using Du Stadebau as a guidebook. In the 1970s, architects and planners rediscovered Sitt as they developed a new appreciation of place. The new urbanism movement counts Du Stadebau as one of its bibles. From a placemaking perspective, I think it's important to note that Sitt's observations all spring from empirical research and a human-centered centered orientation. He was trying to understand what architectural characteristics appealed to the person on the ground, not an abstract design theory or some notion of zeitgeist. My conclusion, although Sitt's research is 125 years old and some spaces he analyzed are 1,000 years old, the principles he identified still apply to our public realm today. There are rules and good spaces follow them. So while Sitt studied the form of urban public spaces, others have studied their use, analyzing both human behavior and human perception. These people have conducted real architectural research, setting up cameras to record how people behave in different spaces and at different times of the day, diagramming people's movements within them, distributing questionnaires to understand people, uh, people's emotional reactions, and uh, creating experiments to test their process of spatial orientation. They've acted more like anthropologists, there are three major players in this group that I'll talk about this morning. William White, John Gale, and Kevin Lynch. <coughs> William Holly White um, was the editor of Fortune Magazine in the 50s and wrote The Organization Man, a bestseller that deconstructed the 1950s corporate values and documented American post-war psyche. It established him as an insightful observer of human behavior. He became interested in urbanism and published two books on the subject. Since 1961, in an effort to combat suburban flight, New York had offered zoning incentives that encouraged the creation of more ground level people spaces. For each one square foot of plaza created, builders could add 10 square feet of commercial floor space to the zoning limits. 20 acres of plaza had been created in a short time, but none of it got much use. White was commissioned by the New York City Planning Commission in 69 to determine why. White used direct observational techniques to record, analyze, and describe human behavior in these urban settings. This work developed into an ongoing study called the Streetlight Project, 
and led to his publication in 1980 of The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces and a companion movie. In 1988, White expanded The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces when he published Rediscovering the Center City. This book is considered his magnum opus of urbanism. In the study, White found that 80% of typical plaza use was concentrated at the lunch hour, and peak time behavior informs much, much of his research. But he found that off-peak use was a better indication of people's preferences. In peak times, they sit where they can, but in off-peak times, they sit where they want to, and less successful parts of a plaza become vacant. White thought that off-peak use patterns were indicators of successful design characteristics. White also observed the differences in the user makeup in some plazas, groups versus singles, young versus old, men versus women. He thought that these differences were an expression of choice and therefore might also be guides to characteristics of success. He quantified that the five most used plazas had 45% of their users visiting in groups, while the five least used plazas had only 32 in groups. He noted that when people visit in groups, it's because they've all agreed to, and therefore used by groups was an index of selectivity. Women were more discriminating about where they sat, spent more time weighing the possibilities, and tended to favor more secluded parts of the plaza. Men tended to take the front row seats and position themselves at the plaza's gateway as its guardians. They were basically uh, predominantly interested in girl watching. If there were double-sided benches parallel to a street, White found that the inward-facing benches were occupied by women, while the outward-facing benches were occupied by men. He thought that the higher percentage of women users was also an index of selectivity. He found that lovers in public places weren't where he expected them. Rather than tucked in the back corners of plazas, White found that most embraces took place in the most visible locations, with the couples seemingly oblivious to the crowd around them. What we today refer to as PDAs became White's most revealing index of selectivity, and he postulated that plazas in which couples feel most comfortable expressing affection are the most attractive ones. White found that when people stand on a plaza, they tend to station themselves near fixed objects, such as a bollard, a flagpole, or a statue. People also tend to sit in well-defined edge locations, such as steps or the borders of a pool. Walls and ledges are favorite sitting places, even if they're in the mainstream of the plaza's travel paths. <clears throat> in a study of street and plaza conversations, White found that people didn't move out of the main pedestrian flow where their conversations usually began. Instead, they remained in it, or actually moved, quote, smack in the center of the flow of 100% location, to use the real estate term, unquote. White found that what people say they do is different than what they actually do. In their answers to questionnaires, he wrote, quote, People speak of getting away from it all and use terms like oasis and retreat. What people do, however, reveals a different priority, unquote. What he found people rarely do is choose the undefined middle of a large space. All this led White to famously declare, what attracts people most, it would appear, is other people. White thought that it was important to document these simple observations because at the time, designers were creating city spaces based on opposite suppositions. The children played in the street because they had no better place. In fact, they preferred the street, as did their parents on nearby students. That workers crowded together at city corners because of a lack of open space. In fact, they gravitated to the street corners in spite of adjacent but unused open areas. That open plazas were more attractive than contained ones. In fact, wide open, undifferentiated plazas were the least used. And that crowding is an inherently bad characteristic of cities. And in fact, as I think we know today, it is in many ways the reason for a successful city. So Holly White started studying the characteristics of successful and unsuccessful spaces, using the number of people sitting in the space as the yardstick of success. Why use those sitting rather than the total people? This notion of stasis is an important concept for us to grasp. White got, felt that it's not how many people are moving through a space that indicates its attractiveness, but rather how many people stop or stay there for some period of time. I would argue Boston City Hall's plaza was a perfect example of that. White ruled out factors such as the amount of open space in a plaza or the proportions of the space as indicators of success, finding little correlation between these characteristics and the number of people sitting. From his observations, he suspected that a stronger sense of enclosure had a correlation, but he couldn't prove it with numbers. His strongest correlation was the amount of available sitting space. No surprise if you're using sitting as your yardstick. So then White started characterizing and measuring seating surfaces to find out which ones worked. 
He studied the ledge at the Seagram's Building Plaza, which starts at seven inches above the sloping pavement and ends at 44 inches above it. He thought, ah, here is the chance for a definitive field study of the ideal seating height by observing people selectively choosing seating locations over this range. Except they didn't. When tabulated over several months, their choices distributed themselves evenly over a whole range of heights, leading White to conclude that in, pop in a popular location, people sit almost anywhere between a height of one and three feet. White found that purpose-built benches did not get used as often as steps, ledges, and walls. He found that the benches were incorrectly sized or were located in places that people didn't want to sit or oriented the wrong way. People want to sit at the nexus of the travel paths, along the edges of spaces, and against physical landmarks, and always facing the pedestrian flow to allow for people watching. He logged the amount of time that each person sat. One might assume that the majority of in and outers account, uh, account for the bulk of the total time spent sitting, but that was not the case. He found that only one quarter of a plaza's total sitting time was spent by those who sat for less than 10 minutes, three quarters by those who stayed 11 minutes or more, and half by those who stayed 21 minutes or more. The lessons for designers, he says, design for the person who's going to sit alone. After lambasting benches as, quote, artifacts the purpose of which is to punctuate architectural photographs, unquote, <laughs> White praises the movable chair. He writes, quote, chairs in large choice, to move into the sun or out of it, to make room for groups or move away from them. The possibility of choice is, is as important as the exercise of it. If you know that you can move if you want to, you feel more comfortable staying put. This is why, perhaps, people so often move a chair a few inches this way and that before sitting in it, with the chair ending up about where it was in the first place. <laughs> the moves are functional, however. They are a declaration of autonomy to oneself and rather satisfying, unquote. And White's time-lapse film across the top of this slide captures a woman doing exactly this dance. White fam later famously urged the use of movable individual chairs in his consultation on the 1988 Bryant Park renovation. They were so successful there and the re renovation so transformative that Bryant Park chairs, as they're known today, have become a staple of public space furniture ever since. White found that sunlight, shade, wind, and water are determining factors in the attractiveness of a public space, especially places in which to spend time rather than to simply move through. He noted that people move themselves within a plaza over time to follow the sun, and that they prefer dappled shade under trees and that they want to be able to touch water and not be kept away from it. If you go to post office square early at lunchtime and sit through a whole lunchtime, you can watch the seats being taken in the sun and then moved into shade. White encouraged the use of public art, music, and food. In before and after studies, he documented their beneficial effects. In both of his books, he states, quote, if you want to seed a place with activity, put out food, unquote. We've obviously done that here this morning. <laughs> Um, documenting the effects of active programming led White to make one of his most famous observations. He called it triangulation. Triangulation, he says, is the quote, the process by which some external stimulus provides a linkage between people and prompts strangers to talk to each other as though, as though they were not, unquote. This in turn imparts a feeling of comfort and friendliness to the public space, which then translates to a feel feeling of affinity or ownership that people have for that space. They think, I like this space and I care for it because I have these memories of things that happen to me in it. I have a personal relationship with it. The fact that many of Holly White's observations seem self-evident to us today is testament to the influence that he's had on the design of urban spaces. Many of the mistakes that designers were making in the 1960s and 70s don't happen as much anymore. Much of this renewed focus on the making of successful urban spaces, the yardstick by which we measure their success, are due to White's pioneering work. He served as a mentor to many, including Jane Jacobs, the urban neighborhood advocate and author of The Death and Life of American Cities, Paco Under Underhill, who has applied White's techniques to measuring and improving retail environments, Fred Kent, who worked with White and now leads the Project for Public Spaces, and Dan Biederman, who led the business improvement district movement in New York City and the renovation of Bryant Park. John Gale, uh, born in 1936 and still alive, has carried on Holly White's approach. Gail is a Danish architect and urban design consultant based in Copenhagen. Gail practiced for six years before he married Ingrid Munt, a psychologist, 
that relationship would change the focus of his work, was apparently she criticized architects mercilessly. <laughs> he writes that, quote, they had many discussions about why the human side of architecture was not more carefully looked after by the architects, landscape architects, and planners. My wife and I set out to study the borderland between psychology, sociology, architecture, and planning. And a 1966 research grant for studies of the form of use of public spaces resulted in the publication of his influential 1971 book, Life Between Buildings, with the first English translation in 1987. Like White, Gale's observations are underpinned with empirical research, and also like White, Gale, John Gale later republished much of his work in a 2004 book called Public Space of Public Life, and an expanded 2010 book called Cities for People. John Gale starts by reviewing people's anthropology and sensory abilities. He states, quote, the natural starting point for the work of designing cities for people is human mobility and the human senses, because they provide the biological basis for activities, behavior, and communication in city space, unquote. He cites studies that have found that the orientation of our eyes, rods and cones, the shape of our skulls, the bending and swiveling of our necks all combine to limit, limit our upward vision to 50 to 55 degrees above horizontal, while our downward vision extends 70 to 80 degrees below horizontal. And we typically carry our heads at 10 degrees below horizontal. This means that the ground plane of plazas and the first couple of stories of the buildings that enclose it are the most important surfaces. And he writes, quote, if ground floor facades are rich in variation and detail, our city walks will be issued equally rich in experience, unquote. Gale documents our ability to see, hear, and smell at different distances. At 100 meters, shapes first become understood as human. At 50 meters, we might recognize a familiar person. At 25 to 20 meters, we can understand age, facial expression, and one-way communication is effective in a loud speech-making voice like mine today. At 10 to 7 meters, we can have two-way conversation. At 5 to 2 meters, we can just detect nuanced variables like blushing. And between 2 and 18 meters, we can use all of our senses, talking confidentially, sensing heat, smelling perfume, and touching. Less than 18 inches in many cultures is appropriate only for intimates. Not surprisingly, he founds that the 100 meter distance and the 25 meter distance are two key thresholds in spaces where the focus is on watching people. The 100 meter distance influences the designs of arenas built for spectator events. The 25 meter distance influences the design of theaters and auditoriums, 35 meters with artificial lighting and microphones. It's no coincidence that most European squares, and you see a, a run of uh, typical average squares in red on, on the bottom, have dimensions of 100 meters or less, and that those with dimensions of 25 to 35 meters seem more focused or theatrical. Gale also defines four ranges of interpersonal distances. Intimate distance, which is 0 to 18 inches. Personal distance, 18 inches to 4 feet. Social distance, 4 to 12 feet. And public distance, over 12 feet. 12 feet is the distance that we subconsciously choose if we want to hear a street entertainer, for instance, but at the same time indicate that we don't want to be part of the show. And note the 12-foot radius circle around the fire breather in this slide. And my, my contention is that, as professional architects, we shouldn't be designing spaces that are the wrong dimensions. You wouldn't design a baseball field that had less than 90 feet from between the bases. You wouldn't design a bowling alley that was the wrong length. So we shouldn't be designing public spaces that have the wrong dimensions, but we do it all the time. And start <laughs> Gale posits that our senses have developed in response to the linear and horizontal movements characteristic of walking, and he maintains that we gather and process visual information at usual walking speeds of 5 kilometers an hour, running speeds of 10 to 12 kilometers, and to some extent at biking speeds 15 to 20 kilometers an hour. So kilometers per hour, basically. So cars, as we all know, because we have a speedometer in front of us when we drive, are much faster. Gale argues that car speeds are simply too fast for human perception of detail. He compares what he calls the 5 kilometer per hour architecture of older city centers to the 100 kilometer per hour architecture of large modern cities, and he laments the lack of detail in them and the impoverished experience of moving through them. He also relates the speeds at which we walk to the distances that we are willing to walk. 
the well-known quarter mile, five minute, uh, and half mile, 10 minute walk circles are the tools that come from this research. It's been found that people are generally willing to walk five minutes in high quality surroundings, that's important, in high quality surroundings, and willing to walk 10 minutes to purposeful objectives like home, work, or transit stations. Gail then moves from the biological traits to human activity. He charts three categories, necessary activities <coughs> like going to work, optional activities like window shopping for non-essentials, and social activities like dining out with friends. Necessary activities are relatively uninfluenced by the quality of the physical environment. They take place under all conditions. However, optional and social activities, the majority of activities in a city environment, are highly dependent on the quality of their environment for success. The better the environment, the more activities will take place for longer periods of time and with more people involved. The designer, therefore, can play an important role in the philosophy of a lively city by providing a quality environment. Gale maintains that design can influence the types of activities possible in a public space, the number of occurrences and people involved, and the length of those activities. And he maintains that liveliness of space, quote, is simply a product of number and time, unquote. Gale says that if lively and attractive cities are the goal, there's every reason to look at staying opportunities and attractions. And again, we see the importance of stasis rather than motion, or as Holly White said, design for the person who's going to sit a while. Gale emphasizes the synergistic effect of people interacting when he makes his well-known observation about high-quality public places. Something happens because something happens because something happens. This notion of vitality being the product of number and time is strongly related not only to the importance of stasis, but also to the importance of density and scale. Life in the city is a relative concept, says Gale. It is not simply the absolute number of people that counts, but the feeling that the place is populated and being used actively. A restaurant with a line outside is seen as more successful than one that always accommodates its demand, even though the number of diners at each may be identical. Here, Gale posits another important principle to be used while designing. In two different places in his book, one place he says, make sure there's never quite enough room, and another he says, when in doubt, leave space out. Gale observes that, quote, people walk, stand, and sit where the quality of city space invites them to do so, and that when people stay for a while, they seek out places along the edges of space, unquote. He terms this the edge effect. He notes that edges limit the visual field and define a space. They distinguish it from other spaces and therefore give it identity. This observation relates strongly to Camillo Sitt's enclosure principle. He also notes that at the edges of spaces, our backs are covered so we feel safe, we often have surfaces to sit on or lean against, and that we occupy a zone that permits us to choose to be in or out of the action, providing a sense of maintaining options that translates as emotional comfort, really just the same way movable chairs work. Recently, we've discovered that this relates directly to an evolutionary trait in humans and many animals called thigmotaxis, or edge-hugging instinct. I'll talk more about that in lecture four. It also relates to Dan Appleyard's 1975 prospect and refuge theory. How many people have heard of the prospect and refuge theory? Fabulous, nobody. Um, the prospect and refuge theory of human aesthetics. Appleyard says that cultural taste is an acquired preference for particular methods of satisfying inborn desires for opportunity, prospect, and safety, refuge. Recognizing these two primal desires gives us a mean for under, means for understanding successful and enduring place aesthetics and the ability to predict them. Essentially, when we evolved from the savannah, we always wanted to make sure there were no lions sneaking up on us, and we wanted to look out for lions that we could shoot as food. And our inbred, evolved place aesthetics favor places that give us those emotional feedbacks. Very interesting. Gale notes that what people don't do, as White observed, is stay in the undefined middle of a space, no, many, no matter how many poorly placed benches we set out. And you'll notice that I incredibly cleverly uh, arranged this slide so that all the people hanging at the edges are at the edges of the slide, and the vacant middle is the middle of the slide. Um, the edge, to be successful, must be designed in such a way to support and incubate as many activities as possible. Gale describes edges in two extremes. One extreme is the soft edge, with shops lined up, transparent facades, large windows, many openings, and goods on display. 
Here there is much to see and touch, providing many reasons to slow down or even stop. The other extreme is a hard edge. The ground floors are closed and the pedestrian walks past long sections of facades of black glass, concrete, or masonry. There are few doors and all in all, little to experience or even reason to choose that particular street, short of necessity. In the architect's terminology, we refer to this as active and passive facades. Active facades are open and transparent, with contact between inside and outside. They have many doorways, offering numerous, op numerous opportunities to enter, and lots of human activity as people come and go. They're visually interesting, with many materials, colors, and textures. They have human scale, with details and construction techniques that relate to the hand of the craftsman that made them, and the person who experiences them close up. They have vertical proportions, this is important, they have vertical proportions, not horizontal, so that new visual information is being presented every 25 to 30 feet, and so that they have a rhythm that relates to pedestrian speeds, and they have a dimension and depth so that there are nooks and crannies in which to physically interact with the facade. Passive facades are the other problem. Later in his book, Gale characterizes edges as either rough with good support points or smooth, with little to offer in terms of staying psychology. But rough versus smooth or soft versus hard, or even active versus passive, the edge concept is important for us, us to grasp. Gale maintains, quote, no single, no single topic has greater impact on the life and attractiveness of a city space than open and lively edges, unquote. And he concludes his book with a plea to city governments, urban designers, and architects, life, space, buildings, in that order, please. So now let's look at our third major researcher, Kevin Lynch. He was educated at Yale, RPI, and most notably MIT. He also studied under Frank Lloyd Wright at Taliesin. I didn't ever do that before I researched it. Lynch produced seven books. His most famous, The Image of the City in 1960, focuses on human perception rather than human behavior. In its introduction, he writes, quote, this book will consider the visual quality of the American city by studying the mental image of that city, which is held by its citizens. It will concentrate especially on one particular visual quality, the apparent clarity or legibility of the cityscape. This book will assert that legibility is crucial in the city setting, unquote. So three cities were chosen for a five-year research study, Boston, Jersey City, and Los Angeles. Lynch's team interviewed residents in each, asking for descriptions of the downtown areas, information about specific locations, sketches, and imaginary trips. They compared the results of the interviews to each other and to the physical characteristics on the ground as recorded by a trained observer. I'll use the diagrams of Boston in today's talk since it's most familiar to us, and it's also the most interesting of the three cities and actually makes the book quite interesting to read because since it was built in 1960, Boston's the most people think these days. Lynch documented that to understand and navigate through a city, people first and foremost create a cognitive map. This is a generalized mental picture of the external physical world based on their experiences. He discovered that the map is the result of a two-way process between the individual and the environment. The environment suggests distinctions and relations amongst the various physical parts of the city, and the observer selects and organizes them in a personally meaningful way. Each individual's mental map of his or her city was unique. However, there were common elements in everyone's mental maps, and Lynch says these similarities create the, quote, public image of the city and involve influences such as social meaning, function, history, and even the name of the area. Lynch glosses over these influences and focused his analysis on the physical form of the city, saying, quote, the objective here is to cover the role of form itself. It is taken for granted that in actual design, form should be used to reinforce meaning and not negate it. I'll read that again. <laughs> It is taken for granted that in actual design, form should be used to reinforce meaning and not negate it. I would ask us all to do that. Here he introduces the concept of place legibility, which is essentially the ease with which people understand and remember the layout of a place. It's one of Lynch's best known innovations. By considering legibility, Lynch sought to isolate distinct features of the city and see what specifically makes them memorable, vibrant, and attractive to people. He took the areas that people found memorable and assigned them a high imageability ranking. Imageability, another term introduced by Lynch that's common in common use today, is the quality of the physical object that gives the observers a strong and vivid image. Lynch discovered that people tend to use five distinct, distinct components of a city when forming images of it in their minds. Paths, edges, districts, nodes, and landmarks. 
Note that they're similar to the characteristics that Camillo Sitt identified for beloved colossus. If these are the components that people use to form a mental image of the city, literally to make it memorable, then it makes sense to me that we should use them when designing to help create memorable social spaces. The image of the city was a landmark in understanding how people perceive, inhabit, and navigate the urban landscape. It postulates that urban space is not just composed of its physical characteristics, sorry about that, um, uh, not just composed of its physical characteristics, but also by their representations in mental images. That's important. That it's, urban space is not composed just of its physical characteristics, but also by their representations in our mental images. Space is not simply an a priori category, but it's socially produced. And I'll talk more about that when I talk about sense of place. So now let's turn to writers I categorize as theorists. And I'm going to close at the end of theorists and allow people to go away. And I, those who want can stay and hear me talk about advocates. So I'm going to focus on Colin Rowe and Fred Coder, Aldo Rossi, and Christopher Alexander. I'll necessarily neglect certain aspects of their theory as I focus on the parts that relate most directly to placemaking. Many placemaking theorists rose to prominence in the 1970s when architects were involved in a reassessment of the modern architectural movement. They were also reassessing the effects of modern planning on the city. Many concluded that city livability had suffered under the influence of modernism, particularly under the dominance of use segregating zoning and car-oriented engineering. As part of this reassessment, architects and planners look back to pre-modern precedent as a guide to alternative practices. In doing so, they re-embraced historical precedent, but did so in a novel, more clinical, and theoretical way. Colin Rowe, uh, born in 1920 and died in 1999, was a British-born, naturalized American architectural historian, critic, theoretician, and most importantly, a teacher. He was influential as a mentor to many architects of the 1970s. Rowe's speculative and, at the time, avant-garde view of architectural history, comparison, and analysis was not a continuous evolution of form tied to dates, influences, and styles. Rowe instead looked at architectural artifacts, buildings, and cities in a simultaneous, non-linear, non-chronological way. For instance, in his essay, Mathematics of the Ideal Villa, who's read Mathematics of the Ideal Villa? All right, a couple of children of the 70s. Um, it's the first uh, piece of architectural theory that I ever read. Rowe used analysis diagrams to posit that the compositional rules used in Palladio's Italian villas corresponded to those found in Le Corbusier's villas at Poissy and Garche. Both were assessed not in their own context, but directly side by side. Embodied in this notion was that there's something timeless and universal at the core of two otherwise unrelated but exquisitely good strains of architecture. This technique suddenly resituated modern architecture within history and acknowledged history as an active influence. In 1962, Rowe took a faculty appointment at Cornell where he met Fred Coder, a student who was to co-author 1978's Collage City. Fred taught at Cornell, Yale, and Harvard where I was his student, and he was the dean of the Yale School of Architecture from 1993 to 1998, which by the way, John, is why I had to go to Ellen's Bible. Um, and John and I couldn't wait to get out of there and then over here. At Cornell, Rowe pioneered the use of figure ground diagrams to help illustrate the essential character of urban form, showing the difference between modern conceptions of space as objects in a void, free space, versus traditional city design of public space as voids carved from the cliche of building mass or figural space. Collage City's cover, a figure ground study of Wiesbaden, in Germany in 1900, is a juxtaposition of those two urban forms in one city. This approach is heavily influenced by the famous 1748 Noli Plan of Rome, the central portion of which I used as my title card for today's talk. In it, Gian Battista Noli portrays the exterior public spaces of Rome and the interior civic and major private spaces as a continuous and interconnected public realm. Rome and Coder also use photographs in their analysis as they do here in one of my favorite and I think hilarious free space uh, versus figural space observations that the Piazza Uffizi in Florence is the jelly mold for Le Corbusier's Unité de Habitation. <laughs> this is a perfect example of Rowe's approach relating two completely different buildings across space and time to illustrate elemental architectural ideas. We do this all the time today, but it was novel in 1970. 
In Collage City, Rowan and Coder focus on developing an alternative method of urban design, derived in part from the observations of Camillo Sid, but largely original. They begin by analyzing and diagramming urban form in a number of existing, mostly European cities, known to be aesthetically successful. They find the same approach to urban space in different places at different times, and they find different approaches to urban space coexisting at the same time in the same place. They find that the urban structure that most interests them is the product of a ceaseless process of fragmentation, collision, and superimposition of many diverse ideas and influences, whether built up over time or imposed by different forces. For Rowan Coder, the most interesting city is not the utopian ideal city defined by a single organizing system. It is the Rome of successful demolition and building campaigns. When it's the product of a single mind, the ideal is Adrian's Villa, the experimental laboratory of an architectural collector and emperor. They love Hadrian's Villa. Who's been to Hadrian's Villa? It's cool, isn't it? It's so cool. <laughs> um, from this platform, they propose a design process in which architectural elements within the city fabric are abstracted to become just that, elements. No longer are buildings seen as specific architectural solutions to specific programmatic needs of the specific owner or client designed by a particular architect with a particular style or approach at a particular time for a particular site. Instead, they are seen as formal constructs that fulfill a certain role in urban space. Examples of edges, focal points, paths, portals, and places overlaid onto urban design problems to help develop and test solutions. They are types. Next, these types become devices or tools in an urban design, almost like chess pieces that each move in a distinct way according to rules. Here, Rowan Coder introduced the notion that architecture behaves somewhat like language, that like nouns, adjectives, and verbs are arranged according to a grammatical set of rules to form sentences, so too buildings of different types are arranged to form districts or cities. This linguistic model and the whole typological approach to architecture and urbanism would become big in the 70s. But what's the process for employing these types? Rowan Coder contrasts using them like a handyman who grabs the most appropriate pre-existing tool from his toolkit to solve a problem against the approach of an engineer who fashions a purpose-built tool for each new specific task. They're not completely happy with either approach, although they seem to prefer the handyman, and advocate a middle ground. Here they introduce the <coughs> philosophy of Cloud Levi, Levi, Levi Strauss and his notion of the brick alert who goes about collecting attractive things and reassembling them into a new but somehow familiar work of art all the while investing something of his, himself into the product, the bricolage. From there, it's no stretch to advocate that urban results will, and probably should, resemble a collage. For Rowan Coder, urban design will become placemaking when it abandons the urge for purest abstraction and engineered total design solutions, and instead embraces pragmatic, discrete, episodic, and eclectic ideas and forms. Our next theoretician is Aldo Rossi, born in 1931, died 1997, an Italian architect who was most influential in the 1970s and 80s. Rossi was, an internet, was internationally recognized, he won the Pritzker Prize in 90, I think. Aldo Rossi was internationally recognized for his theoretical writings, his somewhat theoretical drawings, and his small but influential architectural output. When I went to school, there were always a few fellow students who tried to draw like Rossi and smear charcoal. His theory relates to the European city and is best embodied in his book, The Architecture of the City, published in 1966 as a collection of lectures. Like Collage City, it's a polemical critique of, modern move, of the modern movement's effects on the city. The book was revised many times and first published in English in 1982, which is the copy that the people who own it here probably have. After Rossi had become well known for his drawings and just as he was getting actual work built, this influential version is a whole but personal theory of architecture's role within urbanity and focuses on the effects of time, history, memory, and meaning. Rather than critique modern architecture and urbanism on stylistic grounds, in the architecture of the city, Rossi instead criticizes what he feels is modernism's lack of understanding of the city. Rossi says that a city must be understood and valued as something constructed by man over time. Of particular importance are urban artifacts which withstand the passage of time. In contrast to modernism's polemics against modernism, monuments, for instance, 
Rossi argues that the city remembers its past through monuments, and that memory and monuments give structure to the city. For Rossi, the city can only be understood through the passage of time. Over time, the built city embodies the collective memory of its people, and this memory is therefore associated with objects and places. Rossi draws a distinction between historicism, the preoccupation with style that modernists rebelled against, and history, which Rossi feels is an essential component of the city. Rossi felt that modernists had thrown the baby out with the bathwater when they rejected history in their quest to banish historicism. For Rossi, historicism is an impediment to architectural invention, while history is, quote, effects and facts, the data of the city with which new but timelessly meaningful architecture can be built. In contrast to the humanist architect of the 16th century, the mannerist architect of the 18th century, and the functionalist architect of the 20th century, Rossi concentrates on a seemingly neutral process for creating architecture. Rossi's process, like Rose and Coders, is typology. If the city is data, its history and meaning embodied in its material or artifacts, then the process of the architect is an analysis of that data. The architect can be logical, rational, and scientific if he analyzes the city's artifacts in order to have a deeper understanding of their underlying roles in the city, meaning their types. Rossi attempts to uncover the, quote, immovable elements of architecture, unquote, those which acquire meaning over time but are timeless. He calls them permanences. They are, they are the primary elements in the city, persistent and characteristic artifacts. They tend to be monuments distinguished from housing, another primary element in the city, by their nature as places of symbolic function, and thus related to time, as opposed to places of conventional function, which are only related to use. Rossi is quick to separate building form from its intended use. In fact, Rossi cherishes architectural forms that are no longer used for their original purpose, but nonetheless survive. Peter Eisenman, in his introduction, writes, quote, when form and function are severed and only form remains vital, Rossi maintains that history shifts into the role of memory, unclosed quote. The building's forms become analogs or representational stand-ins for their former uses and meanings. Rossi talks a lot, of, lot about analogy, analogous architecture, and analogous cities. In his drawings and his built work, Rossi attempted to distill these immovable objects and permanences through a process of what he called repetition and fixation. In his buildings, he organizes purified and simplified elements, rotundas, cubic blocks, bridge-like walks, columns, and smokestacks, like buildings would be organized in a city, lined up in rows as on a street, gathered around a courtyard as around a piazza, enclosed by a wall as in a fortified city, or related to an axis as in an imperial district. His buildings are, in fact, like little cities. For Rossi, the city is a theater of human events. That's an important concept. The city is a theater of human events. Its permanences provide fixed scenes for human interaction, which the designer cannot necessarily foresee. He likes the fact that the architect can't anticipate exactly how his buildings will be used over time. The most enduring architecture for Rossi is that which, in his words, stops short of the event. Rossi gave this ideal idea built form, for example, at his school at, at Fagnano Alana, where he designed grand steps leading up to the gymnasium as a place for school rituals, such as the taking of class photos. Rossi feels rituals are important in the city and that architecture should provide the backdrop against which they can be played out. Rituals is also an important point I'll bring up uh, in my fourth lecture. All of this leads to Rossi's most important idea for us, that of the locus solus or singular place. The city as theater isn't just a site that can accommodate and give meaning to events and rituals. It is an event in itself. The singularity of a place is recognizable in the distinct permanences that mark the events that have or can happen there. Unlike the modernist zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, Rossi's locus solus is the spirit of the place. For Rossi, it's all about the specific place. He writes, quote, urban studies never attribute sufficient importance to importance to research dealing with singular urban artifacts. By ignoring them, precisely those aspects of reality that are the most individual, particular, irregular, and the most interesting, we end up constructing theories as artificial as they are useless." Unquote. Peter Eisenman sums this all up by saying, quote, included in this idea of the locus solus is the specific but also universal relationship between a certain site and the buildings that are on it. Buildings may be signs of events that have occurred on a specific site. 
And this threefold relationship of site, event, and sign become a characteristic of urban artifacts. Hence, the locus solus may be said to be the place on which architecture or, or form can be imprinted. Architecture gives form to the singularity of place, close quote. And site, event, and sign, I think, are another way of talking about form, activity, and meaning, which is our three-legged stool. So the final uh, theorist we'll look at today is Christopher Alexander, born in 1936. An architect noted for his book, A Pattern Language, uh, published in 1977. It's actually the second part of a trilogy of, of books. The first is an explanation of his architectural theory. The second, the pattern language, is a guide to its practical application. And the third is an example of its execution. The third book is, don't bother. Um, he earned the first PhD in architecture ever awarded at Harvard and the first AIA gold medal for research in 1972 for, a work, for the work that led to a pattern language. Alexander claims, quote, there is one timeless way of building. It is thousands of years old and the same today as it has always been. It is not possible to make great buildings or great towns, beautiful places, places where you feel alive, except by following this way, close quote. And he says there's a central quality for places designed in a timeless way. I'll quote him again. This quality is objective and precise, but it cannot be named, unquote. This kind of reminds me of Harry Potter's villain, he must not be named. Um, this is the quality that must not be named. Um, he offers words that aren't quite sufficient, alive, comfortable, free, exact, egoist, eternal. None of them quite do it for him. Later in a 2004 book, Alexander would finally call it wholeness. W-H-O-L. This quality without a name relates architecture to human beings and induces feelings of belonging to the place. He writes, quote, in order to define this quality in buildings and towns, we must begin by understanding that every place is given its character by certain patterns of events that keep on happening there, unquote. And this obviously has similarities to Ross's theory. Alexander tries to explain what he means by patterns, which are the subject of his entire second book. Quote, these patterns of events are always interlocked with certain geometric patterns in the space. They are the atoms and the molecules from which a building or a town is made. He contends further each pattern in the space has a pattern of events associated with it. Of course, the pattern of space does not cause the pattern of events, neither does the pattern of events cause the pattern in the space. The total pattern, space and event together, is an element of people's culture. And I would argue there's our three-legged stool again, form, activity, and meaning, or uh, form, event, and culture. Noting that some towns and buildings are more full of life than others, he hypothesizes that, quote, Somehow the greater sense of life which fills one place and which is missing from another must be created by these patterns too. And he concludes that some patterns are not alive because they don't resolve their inner forces or allow people to resolve the inherent conflicts in life. He gives examples of a column that meets a beam without a capital or a, or, or a, a strut, uh, a courtyard that only has one way in so that people can't move through it and they have to turn around and go out. Things, that, things like that, that that are not alive because they don't resolve their inner forces. He says patterns are rules of thumb that people have used for centuries. Note the similarity between Alexander's rules of thumb, Rowan Coder's handyman tools, and Rossi's permanences or analogs. And he writes, quote, I began to wonder if there was a code, like the genetic code for human acts of building. It turns out that there is. It takes the form of language, unquote. He maintains that a pattern language is not limiting, but rather allows you to be creative. He says, just like the rules of English make you creative because you, they save you from having to bother with meaningless combinations of words, it is only because a person has a pattern language in his, in his mind that he can be creative when he builds, unquote. He then narrates his process for identifying and using patterns that are alive in the generation of a design. It's all a bit, goes on for chapters, and it's all a bit mysterious. He writes, quote, of a process of unfolding like the evolution of an embryo in which the whole proceeds its parts and actually gives birth to them by splitting. It's, it's, it's all kind of, it's, it's, it's written like scripture almost. Um, the bottom line is that the process must be organic with all parts interrelated and interdependent. He works both ends against the middle and back again. Uh, this makes the design inherently beautiful, meaningful, and most importantly for him, of an ageless character. We can compress Alexander's process for 
developing his patterns because it's really the patterns themselves as enumerated in the second book that have been the most influential. The pattern language lists 253 different and interrelated patterns, things about that, that thing. Um, it's all a bit much. I've edited, down, I've edited down this list to 44 patterns that I think have direct applicability to placemaking and you see them on the screen. Today I'll talk about just three of those patterns to give you a taste. In his pattern 106, Alexander argued, they're all numbered, um, Alexander argues for what he calls positive space. Alexander refers to positive space as having the mathematic characteristic of being convex and its boundary being concave, that a line joining any two points bordering the space lies within that space. He cautions that complete enclosure, however, can cause a feeling of claustrophobia that limits its use. Therefore, he advocates, quote, make all the outdoor spaces which surround and lie between your buildings positive. Each, give each one some degree of enclosure. Surround each space with wings of buildings, trees, hedges, fences, arcades, and trellis walks and, until it becomes an entity with a positive quality that does not spill out indefinitely around corners. And you'll hear me talk about some of those elements when I talk about forum next week. For Alexander, pattern 121, the shape of the pathway, is also important. Although paths are primarily for movement, he feels that successful paths are those that encourage stopping and lingering. He writes, quote, streets should be staying in, not just moving through as they are today, unquote. The path shape, therefore, should swell and constrict. It should be shaped to provide places of stasis as well as those for movement. Like William Holly White and John Gale, Alexander argues that, quote, the life of a public square forms naturally around its edge. If the edge fails, then the space never becomes lively, unquote. Essentially, another advocate of the soft edge, Alexander says, quote, if the space, if the edge does not provide people with places where it is natural to linger, the space becomes a place to walk through, not a place to stop. It is therefore clear that a public square should be surrounded by pockets of activity, shops, stands, news racks, benches, displays, rails, ports, gardens. In effect, the edge must be scalloped, unquote. So despite their differences, the differences between their theories and their architecture, the importance uh, for placemakers of all, the all three theorists that I've talked about today can be boiled down to, they developed their theories in response to a frustration with what modernism had done to the structure of the city, and more specifically to the public places within that city. All three believe in typology, that architectural components behave as types, that they assume, assume certain identities, roles, and functions based on specific and distinctive traits or characteristics. They believe in a linguistic analogy that there are certain rules to the way these types can be aggregated to create buildings and to the way buildings are combined to form city spaces. They believe that the method for combining types, according to these language-like rules, can be like a handyman's use of familiar and available tools in the solution of a specific problem or task. And they believe that familiarity, memory, meaning, or even the mysterious quality without a name plays a role in places designed in concert with the way people naturally relate to space. So I've used up an hour. Those of you who want to leave can leave. If people <laughs> speech, William Holly White, who at that time was the editor of Forum, uh, Fortune rather, invited Jacobs to write a piece for the magazine. That 1958 article, Downtown is for People, contained her first public criticism of Robert Moses, the great New York urban planner and highway builder. This wasn't popular with the supporters of urban renewal, but it brought Jacobs to the attention of the Rockefeller Foundation. The foundation had moved aggressively into urban topics with an award to MIT for studies of urban aesthetics that would become Kevin Lynch's book, Image of the City. It's interesting today to discover how all these people were hooked into each other that we don't, we just don't understand that today. The foundation awarded Jacobs a grant to quote, explore the field of urban design to look for ideas and actions which may improve thinking on how the design of cities might better serve urban life, including cultural and humane value, unquote. This work would be published in 1961 as The Death and Life of Great American Cities. The book remains one of the most influential in the, American, in the history of American city planning. It introduced terms like social capital, mixed primary uses, ballet of the sidewalk, and eyes on the street, 
which became popular in urban design, sociology, and other fields. We still use those terms today. In Death and Life, Jacobs paints a poor picture of city planning, labeling it a pseudoscience, and liking the then current urban renewal plans to quote, the state of medical knowledge of times in which elaborate academic techniques for bloodletting were the norm, unquote. Angry city planners called her a housewife and an amateur. In her, in her introduction, she takes on the Garden City movement, the regional planning movement, Corbusier and CM's Radiant City movement, and even the City Beautiful movement. She concludes it by writing, quote, their conceptions have harmoniously merged into a sort of radiant garden city beautiful, such as the immense Lincoln Square project for New York, in which a monumental city beautiful cultural center is among a series of adjoining radiant city and garden city housing, shopping, and campus centers. And by analogy, the principles of sorting out the different uses and of bringing order by repression of all plans with the planners have easily extended to all manner of city functions until today, a land use master plan for a big city is largely a matter of proposed placement, often in relation to transportation, of a series of decontaminated sortings. From beginning to end, from Howard and Burnham to the latest amendment on urban renewal law, the entire concoction is irrelevant to the working of cities. And I wish I had more time to go into it. I urge you to at least read the introduction. It is one of the most entertaining pieces about um, city planning in the 20th century that I've ever read. She talks about Corb's Radiant City, and she says, if, if the purpose of the city is for Christopher Robin to go hoppity hoppity across the, the park, then what's wrong with Corb? It's, it's full of stuff like that. It's hilarious. It's really good. <laughs> Um, her fight with Robert Moses has been chronicled in the recent Anthony Flint book, Wrestling with Moses, in two segments of the Rick Burns PBS documentary on New York and many histories of the times. In the Burns documentary, Moses is quoted as saying, quote, we simply repeat that cities are created by and for traffic. A city without traffic is a ghost town. The area between Canal and Third Street, a strip three quarters of a mile wide, is the most depressed area in lower Manhattan and one of the worst, if not the worst, slums of the entire city, unquote. Well, Jacobs had, in her article, just proclaimed that downtowns are for people, not traffic, and had just documented and romanticized the buried urban life of the West Village. They could not have been at more polar opposites. You can probably guess that James Jacobs' prescription for successful city advocates a messier and more diverse mix of uses of building types, street types, transportation modes, and of people. She advocates a closer understanding of the complex working of cities, and she adopts a sociological viewpoint from which to analyze them. Jay Jacobs bases her prescriptions for the city on what she claims is how cities actually work on the ground, rather than how they should work according to urban design theory. Half of her text deals with the larger scale of city planning and larger issues of investment and development regulations. But since this is a talk on placemaking, I'll focus at the smaller scale and on what really has been the primary impact of her work a thorough understanding of how streets and squares and parks work in a city environment. She writes that streets and their sidewalks, the main public places of a city, are its most vital organs. Think of a city and what comes to mind. It's streets. If the city streets look interesting, the city looks interesting. If they look dull, the city looks dull, unquote. She explores what she says are the three primary uses of sidewalks, safety, contact, and the assimilating of children. Safety is the most important because she writes, quote, great cities are not like towns only larger. They are not like suburbs only denser. They differ from towns and suburbs in basic ways. And one of these is that cities are by definition full of strangers. She goes on to say, the first thing to understand that the public, the first thing to understand is that the public peace, the sidewalk and street peace, is not kept primarily by the police, necessary as police are. It is kept primarily by an intricate, almost unconscious network of voluntary controls and standards among the people themselves and enforced by the people themselves, unquote. What's interesting for us as architects is that Jacob says that this intricate network is made possible by a specific physical environment. She maintains that the street safety is promoted by one, a clear demarcation of public space from private space. Two, her famous eyes on the street, made possible by buildings which do not turn their backs to it. And three, the continual flow of pedestrians made possible by multiple entry points and uses of interest that lead people to walk along the street. She writes that it's not as simple as it might be to achieve the 
the objective of natural street surveillance, writing, quote, you can't make people use streets they have no reason to use. You can't make people watch streets they do not want to watch. Nobody enjoys sitting on a stoop or looking out a window at an empty street, and nobody does such a thing, unquote. The requisite for an active street is a substantial quality of stores, bars, restaurants, and other public places sprinkled along the sidewalks of the district. They work to aid in sidewalk safety in four ways. One, they give residents and strangers a reason to use the sidewalks. Two, they draw people along the sidewalks past places which have no attractions. Three, the shopkeeper, shopkeepers act as sidewalk guardians. And four, the activity generated by people doing errands attracts yet more people. Jacob writes, quote, this last point, that the sight of people attracts still other people, is something that city planners and city architectural designers seem to find incomprehensible, unquote. And in this, obviously, she echoes the findings of William Holly White. She observes what she calls the ballet of the sidewalk, the coming and goings of interactions of residents and strangers and shopkeepers throughout the day as they each go about their routines. She marvels that the ballet is unplanned, but is, it's the sign of a vibrant neighborhood. The street's second role in the life of the city is as the main venue for social contacts. The street and the sidewalk provide multiple different settings for contact between people, buying things, asking directions, loitering on corners, stoop sitting. She mockingly quotes reformers saying, quote, this is deplorable. If these people had decent homes and a more private outdoor space, they wouldn't be on the street. She then writes, quote, this judgment represents a profound misunderstanding of cities. It makes no more sense than to drop in at a testimonial banquet in a hotel and conclude that if these people had wives who could cook, they would give their parties at home. The point of the testimonial banquet and the social life of city sidewalks is precisely that they are public, unquote. She posits that the public activity is based on an implied public trust and that this trust is, quote, formed over time from many, many little public sidewalk contacts. Jacob says that such trust cannot be institutionalized and that it can't be built in an artificial public places such as a housing project's common room. The paradoxical reason for this is the lack of private commitments in public contacts. I'll say that again. The paradoxical reason is the lack of private commitments in public contacts. She writes, quote, to understand such problems, to understand why drinking pop on the stoop differs from thinking, drinking pop in the game room, we must look into the matter of city privacy, close quote. She says that in between spaces, the common room or even suburban institutions, ask people to invest more of themselves into the social, social contacts that happen there than they are comfortable giving. And when forced to choose between sharing much or nothing, they will choose nothing. The beauty of the public relationships on the sidewalk of a city, she claims, is that the boundary between their private and public aspects is so clear. One may have many public acquaintances about about whom one knows only the habitual subject of contact. I, for instance, inquire about the golf game of a guy that I've commuted to work with on the train for close to 20 years, Mike, because I know he's an avid golfer, but I don't even know his last name. We maintain large, <clears throat> large swaths of privacy and invest only the required familiarity in the public relationship. At the same time, it makes the commute enjoyable, and we would rush, <clears throat> excuse me, we would rush to each other's defense if there was a public incident. Public sidewalks, Jacob says, allow people to maintain social contacts without having to choose to share much or nothing. She then examines the physical conditions that support city diversity and economic ones that produce lively cities. Jacobs first says that it's only in areas of largeness and density, in cities that the population, where the population is numerous enough and close enough to support wide ranges of retail, entertainment, and cultural choices. She notes that suburbs are dominated by supermarkets and multiplex cinemas, well, cities support more numerous and more diverse, but smaller groceries and theaters. This is actually being undermined by Amazon deliveries these days, which is you know, fascinating. Um, she writes, quote, wherever lively and popular parts of cities are found, the small outnumber the large. These small enterprises would not exist somewhere else in the absence of cities. Without cities, they would not exist, close quote. But she notes, small and diverse operations that accrue the advantages of a city location still require customers to be close. Quote, once they are unable to be supported at close convenient intervals, they lose this advantage. In a given geographical territory, half as many people will not support half as many enter enterprises spaced at twice the distance. When distance inconvenience sets in, the small, the various, and the personal wither away. So we're back to the five and 10 minute walks of 
She defines four necessary conditions. One, mixed uses. Two, short blocks. Three, diversity of buildings. And four, density of people. One lesson for us as placemakers is that distinct districts must serve more than one primary function to ensure presence of different types of people using the same facilities for different reasons at different times of the day and different days of the week. Jane Jacobs had a profound influence on a subsequent generation of architects and planners who embraced her aesthetic, the favoring of redundancy and vibrancy over order and efficiency. Her advocacy of incremental development and her condemnation of large-scale tabula rasa projects and her appreciation of the distinctive small-scale places in the lively city districts that coalesce around them created a design climate in which placemaking rose to new prominence amongst that new generation, which inspired the creation of the Congress for the New Urbanism. CNU's 1993 foundation text, their charter says, quote, we advocate the restructuring of public policy and development practices to support the following principles. One, neighborhoods should be diverse in use and population. Two, communities should be designed for the pedestrian and transit as well as the car. Three, cities and towns should be shaped by physically defined and universally accessible public spaces and community institutions. And four, urban places should be framed by architecture and landscape design that celebrate local history, climate, ecology, and building practice. New urbanism has obviously had a profound influence on the planning and design practices that permeate place over project, including the complete streets and smart growth, smart growth movements, principles such as transit-oriented development and traditional neighborhood design, uh, walkability practices, mixed-use districts, districts, and place-based development. The new urbanist principles also form the backbone of form-based codes and lead for neighborhood development uh, program and the HOPE 6 uh, public housing uh, program. New urbanism is also closely related to the urban village movement in Europe. One early and well-publicized example is Poundbury, England, built under the sponsorship of Prince Charles. The prince's traditional architectural tastes are well known and were made infamous by his comment that the proposed modern addition to the National Gallery was, quote, like a monstrous carbuncle on the face of a much-loved and elegant friend, unquote. Since that remark, made when the prince was invited to present the Royal Institute of British Architects 1984 gold medal for architecture, no less. I never knew that. I never knew that's where he made that comment. Quite a style war broke out in the uh, British architectural world. The prince decided not simply to criticize British modern architecture, but to demonstrate how he thought it should be done. So he started the 400-acre Poundbury, appointing Leon Creer in 1988 as master planner. In Creer's diagrams on the right, note that Poundbury is divided into four districts, or as he calls them, quarters. Each quarter has a commercial square at its heart. The quarters are divided by fast roads with greater traffic capacity, while the squares are connected by slow roads that carry less traffic. The fast roads establish each quarter's cognitive boundary. The slow roads allow shop fronts to spread out, spread out from the squares and pedestrian travel along them links the hearts of each district together. The quarters are sized so that its square is within a 10 minute walk from its edge and the centers are located so that they're within a 10 minute walk of each other. The organizing principle of Poundbury is therefore completely related to placemaking and the establishment of distinct and identifiable places as a means of giving scale to the town, identity to its components, and as an aid to wayfinding through it. And so, of course, this leads me to Leon Creer, who's well known as a passionate advocate for traditional city planning around distinctive places and also for the use of traditional architecture. He's also known for his crazy hair. <laughs> Leon Creer, was, and he's a really nice guy. I've actually had drinks with him. It's, it's, he's a really nice guy. Um, Leon Creer was born in 1946 in Luxembourg. At the age of 22, he abandoned his architectural studies after only one year to work for James Sterling in London. And it's interesting to remember that Sterling was Colin Rowe's most notable early student. So again, what goes around comes around. After three years at Sterling's office, Creer spent the next 20 years in academia. In this period, Creer's statement, quote, I am an architect because I don't build, unquote, became famous as an expression of his uncompromising anti-modernist attitude. He earned the nickname Paper Tiger because for a long time he refused to build anything that wouldn't measure up to his ideals, so he simply drew. Yet at the same time, Creer grew into one of the most influential neo-traditional architects and planners, largely through his ideogram sketches and cartoons that poked fun at the failure of modern city planning 
and at modernism's tendency to produce isolated object buildings. Here you see some of those cartoons. Clockwise from the upper right, we have a critique of what Creer sees as the arbitrary forms chose for modern monuments, in which a museum might as well be an Alvo, Alvo Alto flower vase. Creer refers to these as so-called objects, as a way of distinguishing them from the historically derived and familiar typological components that he calls nameable objects. At the bottom left is his lament that contemporary clients in society seem to accept what he sees as the craziest forms for buildings, but, with the, but that when he proposes vernacular and classical buildings, they think he's crazy. At the upper left is his argument that modernism is just a blip on the historical radar screen <laughs> when one takes into account the totality of architectural history. And finally, at the top center, we have him laughing at Sir Norman Foster for his hubris in London. Creer seems to think that Foster should consult a doctor if it lasts for more than four hours. <laughs> One of Creer's best known ideograms is at the left. This diagram argues that the essential social nature of the city, true civitas, is made by the combination of the poche and structure of the city's blocks formed by its functional, residential, and office buildings, what Creer labels res economica, with its ceremonial and iconic monuments, what Creer labels res publica. This was a powerful diagram that influenced both new urbanism and re re that recent place-making thought. This stance led him in his early competitions to adopt a multiple buildings approach. As projects get bigger, he argued, the building should not get bigger, but should divide up into parts that retain a human scale. His competition entries were distinctive because they created defined, usually public spaces between these individual parts, regardless of whether they were required in the program or not. His signature skewed or rotated elevations emphasized the pedestrian's view of the buildings and tantalizingly hinted at the spaces that lie within. In explaining Creer's approach, Jacqueline or Jack Robertson, Robertson has written, quote, Creer's buildings grow out of his towns and not vice versa. Unless he can conceptualize and con control, at least to some extent, some larger order, constructing some disembodied part is of no interest. Since the point of the game is social interaction, unless others are involved in the outcome, he's unwilling to play at all. This is, of course, a radical departure <coughs> from the architect who is expected to be interested in only his objects. All career single buildings belong to larger families or groups from whom they derive and to whom they give meaning. His architecture is only about relationships and about differences, and by definition can never merely be self-referential or self-inflicting. No antisocial hero buildings stand alone for him. The city is the focus and purpose of the design, the giver of meaning. Indiv individual buildings are born out of its order and requirement. They are never isolated works of art in and of themselves. The city is the work of art." Close quote. For Creer, the public spaces are more important than the buildings that define them. And he has written, quote, public space is a void, a structured and structuring void, with specific dimensions, forms, and characteristics. The form of the city and its public spaces cannot be the object of arbitrary experiments. Public spaces can be built only in the forms of streets and squares, close quote. Let me give you another Creer quote that closes the loop back to the beginning of this talk. Creer writes, quote, it is my conviction that the concepts of urban spaces discussed by Camillo Sitt are of enormous value and that they have only temporarily lost their relevance as instruments for urban design. And that's the lesson I'm arguing that all of the advocates want to teach us, that large-scale functionalist divisions of uses and megastructures work against the liveliness of the city, that object buildings don't often help shape an attractive and defined public realm, that plazas designed merely to display an architectural icon don't usually give support to the activities that might otherwise thrive there, and that an important role of most urban buildings is to create place. So that's my conclusion. Uh, next week, uh, next Friday, I'll talk about the form of public space. Perfect. Thank you.